My family originally left Lebanon during the country's 15-year tragic war. The life claimed the life of over 200,000 civilians. For far too many, the war left a legacy of family loss. My family was no exception. The conflict claimed the life of my mother's brother, his wife, and their infant daughter. To this day, my mother has a hard time speaking about my uncle Habib. After fleeing Beirut, my family bounced around the Middle East, and out of all places in the world, we ended up in Connecticut, where I was soon born. This is me as a baby. <laughs> After the end of the Lebanese Civil War, my family decided to move back to our country, where we stayed for a half decade. The next thing I knew it, we were on the go once again. When I still go back to the International Airport in Beirut, they have a hard time pronouncing the place of my birth and customs. We were on the go once again, like I said, this time not due to war, but for finances. In order to afford college for my four older brothers and sisters, my family decided to leave our country, but for good this time. I did not know where in the United States we were going to go, but I would soon find out that San Diego, California would be our new home. My father could not find work in San Diego, so he was forced to go to Saudi Arabia to support us, and for many years my family had to split up. When my brother and I played soccer in the streets of Lebanon, we always played in back neighborhoods with narrow streets, and invariably our game would get ended when an angry old man would get mad and pop our ball. <laughs> But when we were in San Diego, we had a much different experience. Due to the time difference between San Diego and Lebanon, we woke up for the first week at two or three in the morning every day. On those three, four o'clock in the morning walks, just like we did in Beirut, we would explore our neighborhoods. We ended up stumbling upon a community park, and I was immediately addicted. We didn't really have those back home, so for me, it was something new. Everything looked perfect, there were street signs, stop signs, things I've never seen, white picket fences, and we couldn't believe that it was all for us. Monetarily and only monetarily, my family was poor by the standards in Lebanon and even more so in the United States. Due to this, I was picked on a lot. Didn't really have nice clothes, didn't have the right shoes. Everything about me was different, and it really didn't help that I looked like a girl. <laughs> Things were different, though, when I was playing sports. The playing fields were even for me. I had a lot of success. I was needed, and I felt appreciated by my teammates. Eventually, this led me to a college football scholarship where I went to Baker University in a small town in Kansas. During my college years, I became very passionate about global issues, especially in light of the 2006 Israeli invasion of my country in Lebanon. For the first time in my life, I felt like what I was doing was frivolous. Here I was getting ready for my next college football season, and the people in my country were being massacred. By the time I was a senior, I decided that I was going to turn my passion in, into my career. So as my senior year was winding down, I started looking all over the internet to get into an international NGO, nonprofits around the world, but I felt like I just could not find an in. Either I was not qualified enough, or what was out there did not really suit what I wanted to do. After graduation, I ended up going to San Diego, California, where at summer's end, I planned to pursue my master's in refugee and migration studies in Egypt. This was, however, until I had a conversation with a family friend and told me something about San Diego that most San Diegans don't know about. In the four years that I was gone for college, between 2004 and 2008, San Diego became the largest refugee resettlement city in the world. From 2004 till now, there's been 20,000 refugees resettled in San Diego County. In five minutes from the community where I live, there's been over 13,000 refugees from Iraq alone. I ask myself, why am I going to fly halfway across the world to learn about refugees when it's happening in my own community? I took this knowledge as an omen. For all of those who have read the book The Alchemist, I decided to pursue my personal legend. But ironically, it took me the opposite direction of Egypt. San Diego is generally known as a conservative city, branded as a surfer town, proud of its military tradition. Not the first place one would think a home for refugees, especially refugees coming from a conflict that many of the men and women have served in. To say, 
the community has been resistant to the influx of refugees that are arriving on a daily basis. I would drive around my community and see hundreds of child survivors of war feeling idle, alienated, unsupervised. It made me feel bad, but my pity was only half justice, and I decided that I wanted to do something about it. Fortunately, I started working as a refugee case manager, where I resettled most refugees from the Middle East and Asia. For every family, I had to do an eight-month family plan. And the one commonality that I noticed amongst all the refugee youth was their unwavering love for football, what we call soccer. I became the quick favorite refugee case manager with all the kids. Always had candy on hand in my office. But most importantly, I always had a soccer ball for them to kick around when the families would come visit me. The love these kids had for football struck something within me. I think it had mostly to do with the fact that I had the same experience of coming to a new country, playing sports and finding solidarity with my peers, finding confidence, discovering who I was. So one day when I was going on a standard home visit of a refugee family, I decided why not bring a soccer ball with me. I approached the two-story apartment complex that had an ocean of concrete in the front with little patches of green grass here and there that the little kids turned into their unofficial soccer fields much to the dismay of their apart American apartment managers. There was a lot of elderly men playing backgammon while their wives were inside preparing lunches. As soon as I rolled up, one of the Iraqi boys noticed me with a soccer ball in my head and he yells, Taba, which means soccer ball in Arabic. The next thing you know, we're playing soccer, and then two, three, five, 10, 15 kids, the entire apartment complex is out playing with me. What I saw was amazing. And that day completely changed my life. All of a sudden, the kids went from feeling alienated to feeling creative, to growing. To, and their, their confidence was bursting out of the seams. I was late to my appointment, but I think it was well worth it. Working as a case manager at the time made me feel very good. I learned about the refugee crisis. I was seeing what was needed. But I found out that when I want to help the people as much as I want to, Sometimes I can be compromised by the people that I work for. And to me, this was unacceptable. So just like I did after college, I started looking and looking and looking for NGOs and people doing the work that I thought was needed. But at the same time, same thing happened again. I could not find my dream position. For the first time, I started to think, maybe it does not exist yet. I stopped looking everywhere else, and I started looking within. The first thing I did was gather the people that have had the honor of my life, the honor to meet in my life. I told them about the refugee crisis in San Diego, told them about my, my proposed initiative to help. We quickly put together a board of directors, pitched in some money, and formed our first all-refugee soccer team. Two years later, the organization that we started, Youth and Leaders Living Actively, has become the first and only comprehensive program in California that uses soccer to motivate child survivors of war. We have 100 refugee children in our program ages 5 to 18 years old. We captured the love that these kids had for sports. And we made them take their education serious and gave them the tools to have success. What I realized from starting any kind of starting any kind of organization, is that if you want it to succeed, you have to let the community take ownership. When the people have a stake in it, they will do anything for that organization or that cause to succeed. I looked within myself and I found the answers. When people come in to follow you, you must treat them as your equals, because others will follow them and others will lead as well. Oftentimes, people think there's social agencies taking care of all the problems in our community. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people doing great work. But oftentimes, the people who need the most help are the most isolated. If you have a vision, and you think that you can see it to manifestation, it's your duty to do so. On my college graduation speech, before I came back and started my organization, the, commencement, the commencement speaker spoke of his near-death experience that sticks with me forever. One day while driving on the I-35 in Kansas, he got pulled over by a police officer. A moment later, he was struck in the back by another full-speed car. Quickly, 
There was flames all around him and he was stuck with nowhere to go. Meanwhile, hundreds of cars were passing by, one after the other. Even though it was obvious that his life was in danger and needed help, no one was stopping. When the man thought that his life was at its end, a man came in and pulled him out right before the flames engulfed the car completely. His message was simple. If you see someone in help, if you see someone who needs help, you should be the person to help them. Now I ask you before I leave, in life, are you gonna be the cars passing by or are you gonna stop and do the things that you think are needed? Thank you so much.